I would like to welcome Deborah DiMatteo to the podium to begin this evening's program. Ms. DiMatteo is a 1988 MBA graduate of Canisius, a Vice President at M&T Bank, Vice Chair of the Canisius Board of Regents, and Co-Chair of the Women's Leadership Council.
and it's bestowed only periodically to those who have distinguished themselves in public life through service to God and community. Since 1955, the president of the college has bestowed this medal only 45 times. Among the past recipients are the Polish Solidarity, Solidarity Leader, Lech Wałęsa, Joseph Cardinal Minzenti, that Hungarian prelate who was imprisoned behind the Iron Curtain for his opposition to communism and fascism, the Jesuit theologian Avery Cardinal Dulles, and the great humanitarian doctor Paul Farmer. Today, we are extremely proud to add you as the 46th recipient. Congratulations, Elaine Shalino. Please come forward. Instead of skirts to class. 
Imagine I mean, wearing a skirt in winter in Buffalo and have to fight. And to break down the walls of the all men's clubs. But we had Lillian, the Dean of Women, and another recipient of the President's Award on our side. I learned the importance of the pursuit of excellence from professors like Larry Jones. Okay, Larry, you gave me the only C I ever got at the <laughs> But then I never finished that research paper on the intellectual liaison between the German novelist Thomas Mann and the German philosopher Herbert Marcuse. You could have flunked me, Larry. So that C was a gift. <laughs> I forged friendships here at Canisius that are stronger than ever today. And I discovered the mysterious power of serendipity here. As a freshman, I didn't have Dick Thompson. My first English professor informed me early on that I would always be a B student. But I had Jim Fallon as my freshman history professor. He was so passionate and caring that I majored in history. I figured I could make up in fact-finding and analysis what I lacked in sheer brilliance. I followed Dr. Malone's lead and specialized in the history of France, which turned out to be a pretty good decision, no? Yeah. Serendipity struck again early one morning on the Long Island Railroad en route to the Hamptons. I had no idea you had to change trains in Queens. But the guy sitting next to me helped me out. And 30 years later, I'm still married to him. <laughs> then, there was the serendipity of motherhood. Alessandra, our older adopted daughter, was delivered by Ida Campagna in Buffalo one April afternoon in 1989. Two days later, Dr. Ida, as we call her, put Alessandra into my arms. My husband and I were so unprepared that she had to sleep in a drawer in my old childhood bedroom on the west side. Ida is here this evening, and thank you, dear Ida, for making me a mother. I look around this room and I see so many people who have touched my life, and they always tell you, don't mention people, like to don't think that you're gonna leave someone out. You know, I once left my Aunt Maria out when I got the Legion of Honor and she came all the way from Florida. So I know I'm going to leave someone out, so excuse me, I, I apologize. But my cousins, the McGavro brothers, uh, uh, Bob and Mike, are here tonight representing my family. And, you know, my father, my father was a tough guy. He used to call them the Cats and Jammer uh, boys. You remember that comic strip where they act out all the time? Well, they've turned out pretty good. They've cleaned up pretty well, you know, and uh, yeah, they were pretty good. Um, Mary Racina, my mother's uh, companion of more than two decades, is here. Barbara Ireland, my friend from the New York Times, and was an editor uh, at the Buffalo News for uh, two decades, and also was a, 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 an editor helping me on this book and my last book. She's my, my secret weapon. And, and, my, and the Holy Angels girls are here. Yay! Yay! Here they are. Yeah, I see some people. I'm not going to name all of you, but I'll name just Kathy, you know, Kathy Carney, Dina, and, and Jean Calhoun, who um, treated me well when some parents wouldn't let their kids come and sleep overnight because I lived on the west side and it was too dangerous. Um, <coughs> Father Hurley, had it not been for Jim Malone and Larry Jones and other professors like Father Bob Park and Walt Shero, who's here tonight, and Dave Costello and, and, uh, and Dr. Thompson, I wouldn't be standing here this evening. The President's Award belongs to them as much as it belongs to me. There are magical moments in life when the clouds part and the sun shines, even in Buffalo in December. <laughs> and this is one of those moments. <laughs> Now with the main event, I'd like to call Dr. Larry Jones, the professor of history.
history at Canisius College since 1968 to introduce his former student, Larry. Thank you, Debbie. I'm part of this uh, very fine event. I can't possibly follow Elaine. I'm not going to try to in terms of making an introduction. I think she does a superb job of introducing herself. I will only uh, reflect back upon a couple of moments. I remember Elaine in that class. But I also remember her as, a, as one student, an extremely gifted and talented a group of students that graduated from Canisius in 1970. It was the first class of women students who had gone through four years of a Canisius education. And both they and uh, a good number of male students were among the brightest students I have ever taught here at Canisius. I can remember my own experiences here. I was uh, basically essentially getting off the boat in New York after having spent two years in Germany, coming to Buffalo and being pretty much out of my own element, at least for a small boy from a small Kansas farm town. And you can't imagine what it was like to have been sort of accepted into that group of students. It was an incredible experience. Excuse me. I certainly didn't expect this to happen. <laughs> some of my best friends from the time they graduated, and I am extremely honored here to present Elaine as our speaker of the evening. I'm not going to say an awful lot to her career. I could mention she's worked for Newsweek, she's worked for the New York Times, she's been working for the New York Times since 1984. She is a specialist in European terrorism, that was her first beat, so to speak. And uh, she has uh, had a number of phenomenal experiences, some of which she has recalled in, in, in various uh, venues. I can remember, I think, uh, the first time that she was in Paris, uh, she had received some assignment to go out and interview someone in a Parisian suburb who was pretty much isolated and kept out of the press. Uh, she went out there, and uh, that turned out to be a person who later came to be very prominent in the uh, in, in world affairs, that was the Ayatollah Khomeini. She's also, so that is one of her early experiences, if I remember. And uh, among other people that she interviewed was Omar Gaddafi. I will leave that to Elaine to tell the details of that uh, in, the inter in, in the interview. Uh, but she has uh, been extremely uh, active in that regard. Uh, she's also published quite a bit. She's now written four books. The one that you have here, The Only Street in Paris, Life on the Moon Martyr is the fourth book, which follows uh, uh, three others, one on Saddam Hussein, entitled The Outlaw State, one on, uh, on the Persian uh, or Iranian Revolution called Persian Mirrors, The Elusive Face of Iran, and then uh, more recently a book called Les Seductions, How the French Play the Game of Life. So she's been very active in that regard as well, and uh, I would mention that in, 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 in large part as a uh, in honor of uh, the book on uh, how the French play the great, uh, the game of life, seduction. Uh, she was uh, decorated as a chevalier of the Legion of Honor in uh, France, 19, in 2010. That's the highest honor bestowed by the French government uh, for her special contribution to the friendship between France and the United States. Without further ado, I will turn the podium back to Elaine for her talk on the, those, the, those were really tears of remorse that he gave me to see. <laughs> we're, we're really still very close friends, you know. We, uh, despite the fact that I'm 100% Sicilian of origin, I forgive you, Larry. <laughs> Um, two and a half weeks ago, Paris was struck by terrorism, so this evening is a time to mourn and to honor the memory of the victims, but it's also time to celebrate a way of life, the Paris way of life. After the attacks, the terrorists warned that they would strike again and that the French people would even fear traveling to the market. Well, I can tell you that my Parisian neighbors are resilient. And the morning after the attacks, the greengrocers and the butchers and the cheesemongers on the Rue des Martyrs were open for business. The 
mood was somber, but there was solidarity with the victims and with France. The routine of daily life must go on. So allow me to talk about the Parisians who live and work on the Rue des Martyrs. They shared their stories and welcomed me into their homes and shops. They gave me lessons about food, wine, history, religion, family, and about gilding wood, sharpening knives, collecting books, even trapping mice. Most of all, they gave me their trust. So this book is a book that bears witness to a way of life that the terrorists tried to tear down. It is also the story of a love affair mad, passionate, all-consuming, never-ending love affair with a street. So I'd like to start by showing you a few views of my street. Rich. This is, a, this is for Larry and all the historians here, because this is a centuries-old map of the Rue des Martyrs going all the way up to Montmartre, uh, which is up a hill. And you can see you know, that several centuries ago it was uh, uh, just a field, of uh, agricultural field, and a swamp. Yes, Paris, my dear friends, was a swamp. The next, the next image, this is what the street looks like in the early, 19, the early 20th century, and it still looks like this today, except there are no more horses. And I live on the street just up there, on the Notre Dame de Lorette, Our Lady of Loretta. Um, next, we've got a street looking up, a view of the street looking up. You can see what do you see in the background up there? Who knows what that is? Sacre Coeur, exactly. If you walk straight up to the top of the street, make a little jiggle, and you keep heading north, you're going to hit Sacre Coeur. By the way, my younger daughter, Gabriella, took all the photos for this book. And I even paid her. The next view is looking down the street. This street was built in the 1830s and 1840s. Uh, and it's, it was such a poor street that when Ausman came into Paris and kind of swept away most of old Paris, the street was poor, too poor to change. So much of these, many of these buildings and much of the architecture dates from the 1840s. And if you look at the street, this is what you'll see. Uh, you know, it's like a little piece of history. But some people look at the Rue des Martyrs and they see a street. Well, for me, I see stories. For me, it's the only street in Paris. Uh, it's, it's only a half mile long, but it's a celebration of Paris and all of its diversity, from shops that have been there for 50, 60 years old, years, to, to cheap little boutiques where they only sell products like honey or uh, little paste, shoe pastries or pâte negra ham. I say and do things on the Rue des Martyrs that I wouldn't say or do anywhere else in Par Paris, and no one except my daughters makes fun of me. Some of, some of you know uh, my parents, particularly my father, who um, from the time I was a student here called Canisius about every two weeks and asked them to um, uh, uh, do something to make his daughter famous. Does anybody, does anybody remember, anybody remember those calls from Tony Shalino on that? Yeah, yeah, there, back there, we got one, yeah, she got one like about every six, every, every couple of weeks Tony would call. Um, but it's, it, it's funny because I, my father was a tough guy, but um, I discovered the good father on the Rue des Martyrs. I really did, because I came to understand this man who really made contact with his customers in his little store in Niagara Falls, Latina Importing Company. And he related to them very differently from the way he related to us at home. And it was only when I came to the street did I, in a way, discover home away from home? Just so that you can see the bridge, the next slide. This is the staircase where I live. And it's, the reason there's no elevator is because it's landmarked. Uh, thankfully, we only live on the second floor. But, um, you know, Paris right now feels like home, in part because I have that same community, communing and, and partage, sharing with the neighborhood that I had growing up on the west side of Buffalo. And those of you who know the west side know that we lived in the Sicilian neighborhood. And the Sicilian neighborhood was different from the Neapolitan neighborhood, from the Abruzzese neighborhood, from the Calabrese neighborhood, from the Campo Bassani neighborhood. We didn't mix. Um, but we had those little shops. Remember, some of you who 
grew up on the west side, we had those little shops where you could buy cheese, or you could you could buy it, you could go and pick out your live chicken and watch them cut that off. And do you pull the grubber? Yeah? Okay. Well, that's that's what I feel on the Rue des Martyrs. Um, this is not a long street, as I mentioned. It's the same distance as, as from Elmwood Avenue, uh, from talking on Elmwood Avenue, from Talking Leaves Books to the Albright Knox. But there are about 200 uh, small shops and artisans there. Uh, there are two fishmongers, and 12 bakeries, and 26 restaurants, grants, and three cabarets, and one bathhouse with a facade like a Greek temple, and three independent bookstores. Uh, I can never be sad on the street, and the reason is because there are espressos to drink. I mean, you want the best cafe au lait, cafe creme in Paris? Just ask Bruno, he'll take care of you. Tell him he likes sent you. There are warm, crusty breads. Now, who isn't happy when a quarter to one, just before lunch, you can go out to the bakery and come home with a hot loaf of bread? I mean, doesn't those of you who grew up Italian, doesn't that make you feel like all is right with the world? And there are cheeses to sniff. And this is how I really bonded with Tony the Food King, because I knew all about Italian cheeses, even though I didn't know how to press a camembert and know when it was right. There are people to meet, like Guy, the antique dealer, who wears his Jewishness on his pashmina scarves, which he always wears which is not done really in France because you kind of hide your religion. But one in one, uh, one Passover Seder, he had no place to go. So he came to us. We do our Passover Seder since that year, not only in Hebrew and English, but in French. So any of you who are of the Jewish persuasion, if you find yourself in Paris at Seder time, we're always looking for strays. <laughs> I once wrote that in a story in the New York Times that we're looking, I wrote a story about Passover. And we got about a hundred, I got about a hundred emails of people saying, hey, I'm going to be in Paris. <laughs> I come over for your passengers. Then there's Michou. Oh, this is a little racy for a Catholic college, but you know, we're, this is the, we're advanced now. Um, Michou, this is not Michou, this is his artistic director, Oscar, and he's playing, uh, this is the 60-year-old transvestite cabaret. Michou is so uh, 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 respected France as a philanthropist that he was given the Legion of Honor by President Jacques Chirac. And this is um, this is Oscar. Does anybody know who Oscar's playing? Any opera buffs here? No, Dr. Ida. That's we got it, we got an opera. This is opera. Think opera. Maria Callas. You got it, Kathy Carney. You got it. Yeah, La Traviata. There we go. Um, now there's also a woman. Next slide. La Hans. She's the only woman in Paris who repairs 18th century mercury-driven barometers. And if you go into her shop when she's working and you're quiet, she'll invite you to the back room and you can watch her work. There's even a century-old bookstore where the woman who owns it, whose name is Gilles Barrett, but nothing to do with Proust, um, uh, the woman who owns it keeps the bookstore closed in the mornings, not because she's semi-retired in her mid-70s, but because she's too busy at home reading all the books. She will only Dr. Thompson love that. She will only sell a book if she's read it. And um, uh, she uh, doesn't even have a computer. She has no card catalog. She keeps it all in her head. Now I have to tell you. Next slide. I have made history on the street because I introduced something to the Rue des Martyrs that it never had before. In French, it's called Chou Frise Non Pomme. Does anyone know what Camel is carrying, holding up? Kale. <laughs> Someday there will be one of those plaques that says, Kale came to the Rue des Martyrs because of the daughter of Tony the Food King. <laughs> But this is a serious street. We have artists, writers, and musicians who lived and worked on this street. So let's look at the next one. Let's turn the lights down so we can see this. This is a painting. Does anyone know who painted this painting in the, in the late part of the eight, uh, 19th century? Degas. 
Take it. Got it. You got it. President Hurley. Give this guy a yeah, He got his president for a reason. <laughs> Miss Lala at the Cirque Fernando. The Cirque Fernando was on the Rio Martin. And then we have another painting. Now everybody knows this, right? Who knows who that painted this? Renoir. Renoir, exactly. Acrobats at the Cirque Fernando on the Rio Martin. You know, when the new Picasso Museum uh, reopened um, in Paris, they discovered about 200,000 little bits of paper. Uh, Picasso was a paper porter. And among the bits of paper they found were ticket stubs from the Cirque Fernando. So even Picasso walked on my street. Claude Monet and Paul Bogan, the painters, were baptized at the Notre Dame de Lorette Church. And Emile Zola, in his novel Nana, situated a lesbian dinner club on the Rue des Martyrs. But just in case you think I'm not cool, I just want you to know that Pharrell Williams and Kanye West recorded songs at a state-of-the-art studio. Yeah, 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 you got it, right, Tony? You read it. On the Rue des Martyrs. People ask me if this book is going to ruin the street. And I say, never. Because this is a street that is steeped in history to preserve it. Because on the street, the patron saint of France was beheaded. Does anyone know who that was? Yeah. Who said that? Frank! I read the book. <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you, didn't, you, you didn't have to say, you could have just pretended that you, you, you could have just shown your natural brilliance, right? <laughs> Santini. Santini was the third century rock star missionary who was doing so well converting the pagans to Christianity that the, the, the Roman soldiers marched him up to the top of the Rue des Martyrs and beheaded him and his companions. But those of you who remember the story know that Santini refused to die. So he picked up his head, he washed it off in a fountain, and he carried it up several miles north where the fancy Santini Basilica is. You know, they buried the kings and all. Who's ever been to the Saint Denis Basilica? Anybody here? Yep, yep, okay. So you know this grand basilica. But the place where Saint Denis was actually beheaded is this poor little known place. This is what the altar looks like. There are only four masses that are said there a year, and it only opens every Friday afternoon for a couple of hours. And this despite the fact that, who knows who's on his knees? How did you know that? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Ignatius and his six companions on the Feast of the Assumption 1534 walked up to this chapel and this crypt and they took their first vows to, before they created the order of the Jesuits. And the guy who sang mass, Pierre Favre, he was the only one among the seven who was a priest, so he got to say the mass. But Pierre happens to be Pope Francis's favorite Jesuit. So, but Pierre had a problem. He didn't have two miracles, and you know how you're supposed to have two miracles if you... Who's, do you have any priests here tonight? Okay, no, two miracles, right? You're supposed to have two miracles? Father, right? Pierre didn't have two miracles. But there is something that you can do sort of like semi-secretly, like the executive order that the president signs late on Friday night when the journalists have all gone home. So, um, so uh, Pope Francis, one day, Make Pierre a saint. So I decided to write Francis a letter, <laughs> inviting him to come to the Rue des Martyrs. And with your permission, I'm just going to read a little excerpt from the book. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, me, and, me, and, me and Francis? Yeah? Okay. This is an excerpt. I had enough going for me to sound respectable. I had been an undergraduate at Canisius College. While based in Rome for Newsweek, I covered the Vatican and traveled with Pope John Paul II. 
My Jewish husband and I were married by a rabbi and a priest, and not just any priest, but a Jesuit, the late Reverend Vincent O'Keefe, who had been Vicar General of the Jesuits and General Assistant to Reverend Pedro Arupe when he headed the Jesuit order. Best of all, my middle name is Francis. <laughs> My younger da daughter, Gabriella, had an Argentinian connection. Her friend, Nick, had a cousin whose maternal grandmother knew Francis. He had been her confessor in Buenos Aires, and she had his cell phone number. <laughs> Alas, she was getting a little old and senile, and we figured that Francis had changed his cell phone number when he became Pope. So I figured I had to get the Pope's address. So I reached out to the Rome Bureau of the New York Times, and Elisabetta Povoletto, one of the correspondents, sent me the Pope's address. And the next morning at breakfast, I said to my husband, Andy, I got the Pope's address. And he put down his spoon. We eat special K and bananas every morning. He would probably be mortified because you're supposed to eat croissants, you know. But um, no, he put down his spoon. He said, he's a lawyer. Yes, what is it? And I said, it's Post Office Box 1, Vatican City. <laughs> so he looked up and he said to me, is this like writing to Santa Claus? <laughs> I addressed my letter to your holiness and began like this. It will be a miracle if my letter reaches you, but miracles happen, no? I am confident that during your papacy, your holiness, you will come to France, the eldest daughter of the church. So I'm asking you to consider a visit to a very special but forgotten place in Paris, the crypt and chapel that marked the place where Saint-Denis and his two companions were martyred. As you know, it was also in the crypt and chapel that on the Feast of the Assumption in 1534, Saint Ignatius Loyola and six companions took their first vows of poverty and chastity. <coughs> I evoked God's presence on the Rue des Martyrs. Saint Ignatius told his missionaries to write not only about their spiritual ministries, but also about the reality of everyday life, anything that seems extraordinary. The Rue des Martyrs and the tiny Krypton Chapel are extraordinary. Ignatius' motto was finding God in all things. And it is not difficult to find God on the Rue des Martyrs. <coughs> I ended by saying, perhaps, Your Holiness, you will one day walk on the same route walk, walked by Saint Denis and Saint Ignatius and arrive at the Saint Denis crypt. I will be there with all the residents, merchants, workers, and students of the Rue des Martyrs to cheer you on. I hope at the very least, Your Holiness, that my letter has brought a smile to your face. And here's the outside of the rich, let's go. This is the outside of the, of the crypt. Now you're going to have to read the book to find out the twist and turns of what happened next. <laughs> Alas, Pope Francis is not yet called. <laughs> even though he sometimes picks up his cell phone and he calls people, and I even set up a sound system in my dining room complete with recording devices just in case he called because I wanted to capture his every word. Um, and he hasn't written. But, you know, I was educated at Canisius. I refuse to give up, because Paris needs the Pope's prayers more than ever. So what do you say, President Hurley? Let's find a way to persuade him to visit. <laughs> Francis could put the crypt on the map. And we have a Martyrium Volunteers Association, and if any of you join, I can arrange for VIP seats when he comes. <laughs> Just like Ignatius, Francis exhorts us to find God in all things. I look forward to the surprise of every day, he once wrote. Well, me too. And boy, what a surprise that will be. Thank you very much.
anti-Semitism in Paris? Uh, you know, there's, there's always been anti-Semitism in France, and you know, France still uh, uh, suffers from the, um, the burden of uh, having collaborated with uh, the Nazis during the occupation. Uh, and uh, one of the best things that Jacques Chirac could have ever done as president was to uh, apologize. Uh, but you know, we've got the expert on the Holocaust next to me, so it's going to be like doing my orals when I was a senior. <laughs> um, the anti-Semitism issue is really complicated because uh, there is such hatred uh, uh, by the majority of the French against um, Israeli policy that what has happened, uh, and it's a, sort of a new kind of anti-Semitism, is, is that it has actually happened on the streets that you Death to Israel has morphed into death to Jews. But if you ever say death to Jews on the street, that is a punishable offense because it's considered a hate crime. And you can be prosecuted and fined and put to jail. Uh, and we're, we're living in an era now where um, uh, not just France, but all of Europe is um, terrified of the waves of immigration. And there is a new kind of hatred, which is hatred of the other and the Islamophobia is, um, is rampant and, uh, and is feeding and, and being fed by, by the far right in France. And this is uh, a, 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 a much more dangerous phenomenon because it's splitting Europe in two. But maybe Larry, you'd like to say something about it. <laughs> this is a first. This is a first. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's, and, and you know, the, part of the problem, just if I can add something, because France is a secular state and, and, and celebrates the, the secular republican ideal called laïcité or la, la, laïcité, the, the, the laic, the lay state, the French don't even count ethnicity or religion or race on the census. So it's, and, and, and most independent organizations, you know, think tanks, are prohibited in, in asking um, uh, a certain number of questions about religion, race, ethnicity. So there, even, there are not even really serious um, numbers on how many minorities there are of all different kinds and, and what are the attitudes. And, and I really feel strongly that um, uh, maybe some good will come out of these terrorist attacks and that you know, we in America embrace the multicultural ideal where we celebrate diversity. And I celebrate my diversity in France. And I'm hoping that there will be a rethinking of this, of this philosophy. Which problems? Uh, Elaine, I'm responsible for all your success. I encouraged you to go into uh, English honors, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> you were reluctant to go in, and I said, I was, so, I was so traumatized by that professor who said I would always be a B student. I just couldn't do it, you know? It was, it was Larry seven, thought I was an A student. You know, I got a couple A's. <laughs> 17 of us, the first time in the first class, they had two short questions. Do they still have buskers, uh, entertainers in front of Sacred Curve on Fridays? And Do they still have what? I'm sorry. Buskers, street entertainers. Yes, they still have bus tours in front of Sacred Curve, yes. Or can you get a good meal in Paris? <laughs> Where's a great meal in Paris? Where's a great meal in Paris? You know, I, I keep my, I write stories like this for the New York Times, 
but I keep the best ones to myself. But if you email me, I'll give you my secret list. <laughs> best thing to do if you're going to go to Paris is rent an apartment, don't stay in a hotel, and rent an apartment near my street, the Rue des Martyrs, because you got your fish market, you got your butcher, well, and you can talk to the butcher for 10 minutes about the two lamb chops for dinner. You know, it's, you'll eat much better if you cook yourself. I've never experienced this myself, but the common perception among Americans is that Paris is a very arrogant and forbidding place. And yet in your book, you seem to have ingratiated yourself to these shackles. What, what's your secret to, to becoming part of the fabric of the street? Well, you know, it, there are codes that they never talk, tell you when you take French. Like, I, I didn't know when I first moved to Paris that you walk into a shop, or you walk onto a bus, or you walk into an elevator, and you're supposed to say bonjour. Did, any, did, did, you, did anybody know that? Who knew that? I mean, you, okay, somebody. But I had no idea. I mean, you walk into an elevator, you're supposed to say bonjour. Imagine going to an elevator in New York and saying, hello, good morning, how are you? And if you don't do that, going into a shop, they think that we're um, arrogant because we're not sort of being supplicants entering someone else's space. Or if you go into a shop and you say, hi everybody, they're gonna say, wait, you're interrupting me, I'm trying to do my job. So this right away sets you apart. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying the French aren't arrogant, but um, uh, if you just say bonjour, it helps. Also, we Americans, we go out on the street and we smile at everybody. You know, or you go into a subway and you're sitting opposite someone and they're staring at you and they smile. The French don't smile. It's not because they don't like us. They, they think we're stupid and idiots because we smile. They don't, you know, they, they give you the look. It's called le regard. It's really like this sensual kind of look. You've watched all those old French movies where all they do is stare at each other for 10 minutes. They never smile. And this is something that we also don't, don't understand, that the absence of smiling doesn't mean they're being mean. It's just that's the way they are. Um, and once someone just does smile to you, it's, it's really entering the community. But it took a long time. I mean, I started in Paris on the other side of the river in a very swank neighborhood, in a, in a bigger apartment, in a, where you couldn't go out in the street, like dressed in your jogging clothes. You know, you were supposed to like look all perfectly um, coiffed and everything. Uh, and it was only when I moved to this other side, which was much more mixed and, and a mixture of working class and middle class and gentrifying and kids and old people that I felt like I could get to know people. But we really bonded over food, and, and that is because of my father. So I have Tony Chilino to thank for teaching me the language of, the common language of food. Just bring some homemade cranberry sauce the next time you come to Paris, you'll be, you'll be all set. Yes? Why did I go into journalism? And what is my view of the state of print journalism? Okay. I went into journalism because I wasn't good enough to be a history professor. I really, you know, I started out in graduate school in a doctoral program, and then one summer I went off to Chicago as a summer intern as a reporter, and I realized I was a much better reporter than I was a scholar. You know, you got to know in life what you're good at and what you're, what you're not good at. And I discovered something I was better at than what Larry has done so brilliantly over the, the, the years. Um, uh, I mean, from the minute you came, Larry, in 1968, you know, we, we were touched by his brilliance, but I couldn't do it. Uh, but I was blessed because I was in journalism in an era when journalism was a real profession because now it's there's a revolution in how we get our information and there's the decline of print journalism and newspapers and you know it used to be that you had your you know, set armies in the battlefields, the Washington Post was there and the New York Times, blah blah blah. And now everyone in the world is a journalist because we've democratized the, the uh, universe with uh, uh, the internet and with, with digital. So I tell anyone who wants to become a journalist is you are the novelist or the actor of the 21st century. So if you have a dream to be a journalist, follow your dream, but have a skill. You know, because you might not be able to support yourself in journalism. I tell that to my daughters. You know, my older daughter, she 
can, or now she's got a real job as a special education teacher, but on the side, she gives private swimming lessons for $75 an hour, thank you very much, which is not bad. And my younger daughter's in graduate school, but on the side, she's a photographer. So find, you know, the old days used to say, when you give the commencement speeches, just follow your dream. No, follow your dream, have a skill. <laughs> Just about every public school in France, you have a plaque to the victims of the of the Holocaust. Uh, I mean, on my street, on the Rue des Martyrs, there is a as a high school that had been a girls' high school during World War II, and the plaque lists the names of the 19 female students and the teacher who perished during the, the Holocaust. And uh, in my book, I actually have. Uh, uh, one of the one of the, the portraits is of a man who um, worked for many years on the Rue des Martyrs in the Socialist Party Cultural Center, and um, had to wear a, 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 the yellow star when he was a child, and he still carries it in his wallet, and he wants to be buried with it. And uh, what was so interesting about interviewing him is that after the terrorist attacks in January against. Charlie Hebdo newspaper and the Jewish supermarket. He went out and marched with a million and a half Frenchmen who marched on the, uh, in public in, the, in, in solidarity in the Place de la République. And he said uh, very strongly, you know, I am French. You know, I felt it then during the Holocaust and I feel it now. And uh, you know, I am not afraid as, as a Jew. And I think that um, you know his testimony is is evidence that the issue of anti-Semitism is much more complicated than sometimes sometimes we in, in even in the media uh, portray it. Yes. What? Stand is stand. Do I think that the attacks in Paris were, were Middle Eastern ter terrorism or just some wild characters? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the hardest things to do as a, when I cover terrorism and when I cover the CIA is to try to figure out motives for terrorism. Uh, but what you had here, uh, you know, the, I wrote this ten, 10 years ago, I wrote a long story about how Belgium is the, is the weak link in the fight against terrorism, because Belgium does not have a national police force, it does not have a CIA, it does not have the same weapons to fight terrorism that the French do. And the fact that this plot was used to use Belgium as a, as a, as a headquarters, as a center, didn't surprise me. You know, it's very easy, too, these days, to go from Brussels or Paris or Berlin and to take a bus to Istanbul and to go straight from Istanbul into Syria. It's kind of like, you know, summer camp for terrorists. And you've got a lot of disaffected youth. You know, and I won't say that there's a link between you know, unemployment, poverty, and terrorism, but a disaffected population that doesn't feel as if it belongs. And it's just so easy to go to jihad. <clears throat> and until this kind of issue gets gets dealt with and until the, somehow the flow can be staunched of young people going into these training camps, uh, there, there are going to be a lot more of these attacks. Hi. Um, 
We heard a lot about uh, really interesting people that you've met uh, throughout the years. Who would you say is the most interesting person that you've ever met and who is the most influential to you, not just in general, it can be influential to you? The most, oh gosh, I never do most. I am terrible with those lists when they say to you, you know, what are your top five blah blah? It's like, I don't know, I can't even think about it. All right, top three. Um, top three. Top three. <laughs> Uh, well, does influential mean that I have to have liked them, necessarily? Okay. No. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, Jacques Chirac on a good day. Uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, Pope John Paul II, except I didn't agree with everything that he said. You know, the problem with him is that if you asked him a question on the plane, and he didn't want to answer it, he blessed you. <laughs> and then if you asked, if you asked him it again, he, he um, blessed you twice. So I have enough plenary indulgences to go to heaven many times over. So I guess he would probably be the most influential, yeah. Oh gosh, I can't, I'm not gonna give away those secrets how many times he blessed me. I, that's, that's me that was between you. Yes. What can the Americans? What can Americans learn from the French? I'll tell you what I learned from them. From not from all French, but from from doing this book. And this is going to sound really corny. I learned to forget about deadlines and forget about goals and to forget about multitasking try to just remember simple pleasures. You know, I started writing this book at a time of transition in my life. And, um, uh, you know, when I moved from this fancy apartment, I was leaving the staff of the New York Times and going on contract. Suddenly my, my, um, my office is my dining room. I'm thinking, what am I gonna do with my life? And I had to think, I started thinking through things in a completely different way. And I sort of threw out journalists um, deadline you know just do what I absolutely have to do now and my and also I was I was the bed you know I wasn't a young a young I was always an old mother but I wasn't a mother of kids anymore so I had the luxury of being able to just say what do I want to do today that um, is going to make me feel happy you know I was saying to Jean Calhoun uh, who I went to high school with the Holy Angels that I follow her on Facebook because she takes the time to garden. And she takes pleasure in a beautiful flower. And you know, we've all got problems in life. We either have you know, sick parents, kids who aren't you know, doing what we want, a spouse that doesn't know what he wants to do 10 years from now, you know, whatever. But we've got to do something that makes us feel good, whatever it is. And I have to tell you, coming to Buffalo for this, these three days really makes me feel good.